May you, may you maybe uh, switch your slides uh, to the right slightly, Martin? Mm. It yeah. is not exactly centered. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, a little bit more, a little bit more. Like that. So, so, okay. It, it, it seems okay. It, it seems okay. May you, may you. Okay. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. Uh, very welcome for your return to the seminar room or the the conference room, yeah, visual. And I'm Masahiro Yamamoto from the University of Tokyo. I will be the chair for the following two talks, two presentations. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first speaker, Professor Martin Guga from uh, Friedo Alexander University, Arang and Nuremberg. And he, he is organizing a, a research review for uh, the optimization and, and also the optimal control control and he will give a talk entitled by some remarks on the town bike property. Are you ready to start? Professor? Yeah, thank you for your nice introduction, dear colleagues. It is a pleasure to contribute to this workshop. The topic of this talk is the turnpike phenomenon. So what is the turnpike phenomenon? Many of you will know it, but still I explain a bit the basic idea. So what is it? Consider a dynamic optimal control problem with a finite time horizon and an objective function that is given by an integral on the time interval from zero to capital T. If all the time derivatives are set to zero and initial conditions and possibly also terminal conditions are canceled, this yields a static optimal control problem. And often it is much simpler to solve the static optimal control problem. And turnpike results state relations between the static optimal state control and the dynamic optimal states controls respectively. And typically for large time intervals, close to the middle of the time interval, the dynamic optimal states are close to the static optimal states and controls. So in short, as time proceeds, the influence of the initial data becomes smaller and smaller. And the terminal data only become important close to the end. So in the middle of the time interval, the initial data and terminal data do not play a big role. On the picture, you see the New Jersey Turnpike. That's also called the Turnpike. This is just to explain the name. So the word Turnpike in principle is a rotational pike, so kind of rotating beam, but it stands here for a barrier at a toll station like a peage. So in fact, the term turnpike describes a freeway where you can travel fast, like on the autobahn. And the idea is if you go by car, you can travel very fast. So often it's convenient to use this autobahn for most parts of the travel, although it sometimes costs an additional amount of money it creates an additional cost. So here are some very early references by John von Neumann and Frank Ramsey from 1937 and 1928. However, the term turnpike was coined by the Nobel laureate Paul Samuelson and co-authors in economy. So Samuelson discovered that in von Neumann's model, a turnpike structure occurs. Here's a quote from a book by W. Mackenzie that is a nice description of the situation. I will just read it for you. There's a fastest route between any two points. And if the origin and destination are close together and far from the turnpike, the best route may not touch the turnpike. But if origin and destination are far enough apart, it will always pay to get onto the turnpike and cover distance at the best rate of travel, even if this means adding a little mileage at either end. 
So this is the turnpike idea that often it is very clear that most of the time you go on this uh, point of maximal bliss represented by the turnpike. But what does this mean for optimal control problems? So you see, it is a very general idea coming from economics. And now we try to interpret this for optimal control problems. To get the idea, let us look first at some very easy examples with ordinary differential equations. I think they are very useful to grasp the turnpike idea. So here we have a one dimensional example with the usual L2 framework. We have a time horizon, capital T greater than zero, a weight gamma for the control cost, and lambda is in our dynamics, in our differential equation. So the dynamic optimal control problem consists in minimizing the squared L2 norm of the control, that's the control cost with the weight gamma, and the state is also here taken in the squared L2 norm. So uh, here we have the dynamics governed by the differential equation. We have an initial state y0 and the simplest possible differential equation y prime is lambda y plus u. And here uh, the terminal state is also given and note that here the initial state and the terminal state coincide. And this allows us to illustrate very nicely the turnpike structure of the solution. And here we can put first the time horizon to 2 pi, and then we can write y as a Fourier series. So we make the Fourier series uh, expansion for y and also for the control. And then we insert this in the differential equation and obtain some equations between the Fourier coefficients. And in particular, due to the squared L2 norm, we can also evaluate the objective value very easily in terms of the Fourier coefficients with a sum of squares, basically, with appropriate weights. And then we can state the full problem in terms of the Fourier coefficients, subject to an equality constraint, which represents the initial conditions. And here we can apply the usual necessary optimality conditions. So here we have a Lagrange multiplier coming from the initial condition, and we see it is very easy to solve this system. And then we get some equations for the Fourier coefficients AK, and the BKs are zero anyway, so it's a pure cost expansion. And we can write down the optimal state, for example, of course, also the optimal control. Uh, but how does this show the turnpike? So for this purpose, we look at the uh, Fourier series of the hyperbolic course, which is given here. And if we separate a bit the left-hand side, so we bring the hyperbolic sign in the left-hand side, then here we have a series that looks very similar to the series that we have computed. In fact, we choose A as this parameter, and then our uh, optimal state, our optimal trajectory y of t has exactly the right form. So in fact, we can also express this as a hyperbolic cos of t minus p. So this is the optimal trajectory for this interval from 0 to 2 pi. And then, of course, we can also transform it to a general interval. So we have some factor to make sure that the initial condition uh, is holds and the terminal condition, and then we have a hyperbolic cost with this uh, frequency. And here's a picture that illustrates what it looks like. You, so you see you see, go down really steeply at the first uh, part of the time interval, and then uh, the state is not visible because it's so close to zero. Of course, the hyperbolic cost is always positive. It never gets exactly to zero, but uh, in the picture, you cannot see it because the lines are so uh, thick. 
So between minus 80 and 80, there's really not much going on. You are really in the picture on the turnpike, which is uh, the solution of the stationary problem, which is zero in this case. Only at the beginning, there's a lot of activity because you have to go from one to zero very fast. Then you go along the turnpike. So this is where you enter the turnpike and so you drive along. And then in the end, you leave the turnpike. But note in this example, actually, you do not drive on the turnpike, but very close to the turnpike. You never reach it because the hyperbolic cost has always positive values. So that did work very nicely and maybe we can do a bit uh, more. So here we have added an H1 regularization. So if we want to have a state where the derivative is not too large, uh, we have a different problem. But with the same approach as before with the Fourier series, we obtain an expression of the um, objective function here with an additional uh, term a eta squared k squared. And then um, with the necessary optimality conditions, we can solve the problem in terms of the Fourier coefficients. And it turns out that it really does not change. Essentially, it's the same. You see, it's just another eta squared here in front of the k squared. That means, Mm. Again, we have the Coase hyperbolic Fourier series only in our free, in our A, uh, the parameter and the hyperbolic cost here, the eta, the weight of the penalization of the time derivative appears as an additional term, which makes A here a bit um, smaller if eta is large. And so we can draw a picture where we compare the two. And here you see there's not a big difference between the two. So the lower one was the picture from before here. And with the uh, penalization for the derivative, you go a little bit more slow. So if you increase, it would be more visible but the hyperbolic shape is kept. So you see here, you have a top line with uh, eta that is one in this case, and the lower line here is the original line without the eta. So here we see that the turnpike structure is very clear. It doesn't change at all. We have again, this interval in the middle. And now, since it works so well, we could also consider an H2 regularization. And here we penalize the curvature. So this is important in some applications. We will mention later this. Uh, so we are also interested in hyperbolic systems and their H2 regularization comes naturally sometimes. So in this example, we can actually see exactly what's the effect with such a weight eta for the square of the second time derivative. And you see now something changes because here we have k to the four suddenly in the objective function. And before we had only the k squared. So that's a big difference here. So before we had only k squared, now we have k to the four and of course, we can solve, uh, again, the necessary optimality conditions and obtain a Fourier series for the optimal trajectory. But now it's different. So the regularity, of course, it's improved. It's now twice continuously differentiable. And the derivative at 0 is 0. And so the picture looks different. And we cannot compute it in general analytically. But in some cases, we see that we have the hyperbolic cost, but also some trigonometric parts. So that's the difference here. And the result is that the shape looks much rounder. So which is what we expect if the H2 norm is uh, also in the objective function. And note, really, in the in beginning, we have zero derivative, so we do not go down steep, but to save on the curvature, 
we have this uh, turn to the left, and here we turn to the right at the end. So that's an interesting effect. It's much rounder, but on the other hand, you see the basic turnpike structure is there. Close to the middle, we go, of course, to zero, and then we turn back to the given point that's given by the terminal condition. However, it's not clear that we still have this exponential turnpike as before. So that was the classical turnpike. And this is with the differential objective function. If we have a non-differential tracking term, here we have the L1 norm of the state in the objective function, the situation changes. Here we have a problem where we only have the initial condition. The initial state is minus one. Note, note that now gamma is the weight in front of the tracking term. And here, the static problem is, of course, again, the problem without initial conditions. So this is just canceled. And then it's very easy to solve. The solution is just zero. So that illustrates that really the static problems are often a lot easier. And that's why we are interested in the relation between the two. So here we can use the variation of constant and insert it in the objective function. And we start at minus one. So uh, in, the, mm, in the beginning of the time interval, we will have a negative state. So if we make the time horizon smaller, we can be sure that this term in the absolute value is negative. And so we can get rid of this absolute value and more generally, we can get rid of the non-smoothness. And then this is our optimal control problem. And this is uh, not difficult to solve by integration of parts. We get uh, explicitly the optimal control. So this is as long as the state remains uh, negative. And the state reaches the turnpike zero, so y becomes zero, if this moment equation holds. And this is the case if gamma, the weight, is equal to the inverse of hyperbolic cost minus one, where s is the stopping time where you reach this turnpike zero. So in this way, we obtain an optimal control where first we go along with this control to zero, and then we continue with zero. And this is the situation we described here. So here we have this optimal control with a plus. We cut off the optimal control as soon as we have reached uh, the turnpike zero with the state. And this is the case for t with s. So for t greater or equal s, we have the state zero. And this is the unique uh, solution of this optimal control problem without terminal condition. And here it is illustrated by a picture. So of course, if we go further in time, the optimal state remains on the turnpike and the optimal control, of course, then remains zero. And here we have a kink, a non-differentiability in the optimal control, but the optimal state is uh, continuously differentiable. And so this is a finite time turnpike where we actually reach the turnpike. And of course, that is very nice because then numerically we can really switch to the steady state after finite time. So this is a desirable situation. And if we make S equal to, so we have more time, then gamma is smaller, and then we come later to the turnpike. So the time where we reach the turnpike is controlled by the size of gamma. This is the message here. And this is the exact turnpike structure. That's another name similar as exact controllability since we reach this turnpike exactly. And of course, this is also related to exact controllability. We can only reach the state exactly if the system is exactly controllable. And the time, the stopping time, is independent of the time horizon t, but it's controlled by the weight gamma in the objective function. 
And now we can add a terminal condition. So where we really go from A to B. And here we go from minus one to one. And to make this work, we need to assume that the time horizon is sufficiently large because then we can decouple the problem into two parts. So on the first part from zero to S, we consider the problem without terminal conditions. And then we consider another new problem without initial conditions, but where we prescribe the terminal state. This problem we call end of S and the solution of end of S has a similar structure as the solution of OC of S only in end of S, there is a starting time where we leave the turnpike to arrive at the fixed terminal state one. So it's just going backwards for this OC of S. And here again, we have an equation for the weight gamma, which tells us that uh, the starting time is S. So if this relation holds between gamma, capital T and S, then we remain on the uh, turnpike until the time S, and then uh, we start our optimal control, which is given here again with an exponential, and we leave then with our state, the turnpike to go to the state one. And now we can glue together the two solutions of OC of S and end of S to get a solution of from A to B. So we go uh, to the turnpike from the initial state after finite stopping time S, and then we remain on the turnpike. And after the finite starting time S, we go to the desired terminal state. So by putting, gluing together the two solutions, we solve from A to B. And I think it is best illustrated by the picture that comes below. Let me show it. Here's the optimal control. So we steer to the turnpike and then we do sort of automatic driving. We remain on the turnpike. And then in the last part, we leave again the time interval. And I've stated this as a lemma and the time on the, that we spend on the turnpike uh, reminds me of the song, We are fan of the Autobahn. This is an old song by Kraftwerk and they describe uh, also that it's very positive to far to stay on the turnpike. And that's the situation we have here due to this non-differentiable tracking term in the objective function. And this has been a very simple system, but we also have studied this for a non-automatic system that's given here with an exponential in the dynamics. And here we start at minus one and we have another non-smooth part of the control cost in the objective function here but uh, the situation is the same. And also numerically, this is reflected very nicely. So in blue, you see the control going to zero after final time. And here in red, the state is also going to zero after final time. And of course, here are some numerical errors. And the time is controlled by the value of gamma, the weight of the tracking term. So here, gamma is one half. T0 is 1.27. And now we have gamma equals one. We increase gamma. And this uh, means that we go earlier to the turnpike. But the basic situation um, remains the same in this phenomenon. And also for gamma equal two, we have a similar picture. And then the time even gets smaller. So we go faster to the turnpike. And these results are to be found in the publication, The Finite Time Turnpike Phenomenon for Optimal Control Problems, Stabilization by Non-Smooth Tracking Terms. This is joint work with Enrique Zouazoua and my doctoral students, Michael Schuster, who just submitted his dissertation. And here in this paper, you uh, find also some infinite dimensional results for linear systems 
with an infinity and L2 norm tracking term. But I think we did not finally solve all the problems for the time, finite time turnpike phenomenon. We, so you saw in this example, it was very nicely to get rid of the absolute value in one in scalar problems and in multi-D problems, it's not so clear how this works. So we are still studying this. But obviously the finite time turnpike phenomenon can only occur for systems that are exactly controllable in the sense that the turnpike is reachable. In hyperbolic systems, you can often reach a lot of states, but if you have a parabolic system and uh, your turnpike that you prescribe in the objective function is not in the reachable state, of course, then you cannot expect this finite time turnpike situation. And um, here we put the complete state, of course, in the tracking term, but we could also use another output, for example, some desired boundary trace. This appears naturally in an application that I will describe next. And then we use the nodal profile exact control. This is a notion that has been introduced for networked hyperbolic system. You know, um, with the boundary conditions, you can always prescribe a part of the boundary traces in the hyperbolic system. But in the nodal profile situation, you have a customer that, uh, sits at the boundary point and uh, desires precisely a complete nodal profile. So more than it can be given by the boundary conditions. And it is uh, shown that often it is possible to completely satisfy this uh, customer to control the system to his nodal profile. And here this also fits nicely in this context of the um, finite time turnpike phenomenon. So wow, did I enter this research? So I want to acknowledge the funding of our Transregio about mathematical modeling, simulation, and optimization using the example of gas networks. And in this uh, large research group with groups in Berlin, in Darmstadt, and in Erlangen, I have a pro, uh, project with Rüdiger Schulz, who is actually in Essen. And it's called nodal control and the turnpike phenomenon. So that's, of course, uh, why, why I had the possibility to do this research due to funding. And it's also a motivation to have this application in the background here. The system dynamics on a single pipe is prescribed by the either thermal oil equations. So this is simple laminar flow, not too fast. Um, by that is described by this hyperbolic system, but note that this is a quasi linear hyperbolic system. And in the gas networks, of course, there are many pipes and they are linked on the network graph and the way the systems are coupled has to be described by certain coupling conditions or node conditions. And then you have a complete uh, model of coupled PDE dynamics on this network. And what you can control is the gas pressure, but it's only increased at uh, compressor stations that sit somewhere point-wise in the system. So the gas flow and the long pipes is only governed by the laws of fluid dynamics, so governed by physics. And here it's really a typical boundary control problem or nodal control problem where you can influence the system only at very few points at these compressor stations. And of course, at the output nodes where the customer sits and take their outflow and also at the input nodes where the gas is entered the system. And here we can consider several types of solutions. And if you do an optimal control problem where you want to have classical solutions, then the H2 regularization comes in handy. And that's the connection to the example that we have seen at the beginning. So time is proceeding. So let me give an overview about the turnpike phenomenon because there's a lot of literature about the turnpike phenomenon. And of course, this helps a lot if you enter the subject. 
So we have seen another non-smooth tracking term with a finite time turnpike phenomenon. And at the beginning, we had the hyperbolic cost. And this is an example for the exponential turnpike situation. And results about the exponential turnpike phenomenon can be found for the context of distributed parameter systems with distributed control by Poretta and Suazua in a second paper. And then also for semi-linear uh, systems in a later paper. And then Trela, Zhang, and Suazua have uh, contributed. And yeah, Emmanuel Trela has been also very active in this field. Also in the context of nonlinear ODE systems, this is a contribution in the Journal of Differential Equations from 2015. And actually, they have uh, shown that in this uh, ODE context, the turnpike phenomenon is very well understood and shown exponential turnpike under very general conditions. Another team that I want to mention is a German team that in a way by Lars Grüne from Bayreuth with Anton Schieler. And there's also Manuel Schaller, who is now in Ilmenau. He came from uh, Bayreuth. Karl Wortmann is in Ilmenau. Tim Faulwasser is in Dortmund. And one of their recent publications is in the special issue on the occasion of Enrique Suazoa's 60th birthday. And I've given it here. And in this group, they often consider a characterization of the turnpike situation by a dissipativity inequality. There you have a storage function and a supply function, and you sort of consider the energy, what is stored in the system, what is initial stored in the system comes from the initial condition. And then, of course, through the control, you can enter some energy in the system and uh, this is in the supply function. And here there's a connection in this dissipativity inequality between the system equation and the objective function. And of course, this is essential for the turnpike phenomenon. And with the dissipativity inequality, you really can characterize the turnpike phenomenon in some cases. And if you want to have books about the turnpike phenomenon, you will immediately find the name of our friend Alexander Zaslavsky, who uh, works in the Technion, and he has uh, many books on the turnpike phenomenon. So there's actually a scale of turnpike properties. I want to describe briefly the scale. So the weakest property is the measure turnpike property. It holds if the measure of the set where the distance between the optimal state and the turnpike is greater than a given bound is uniformly bounded independently of the time horizon. So that's good to have a weak property to start. And if it's a bit stronger then you have the integral turnpike, there you measure the distance between the turnpike and the current state by an integral norm. And you show that also this is uniformly bounded independently of the time horizon. And then I have introduced the turnpike property with interior decay recently. So in the measure turnpike property, it's not clear where is this point where the distance is large. Is it in the middle on the time interval? It is close to TR. This would be completely counterintuitive. And to avoid this, here I consider intervals in the interior of the time interval. And there we have a decay of order one over T. So this makes sure that in the interior, the values of this distance are really small. So you are really close to the turnpike. And finally, I shortly mention a paper with Emmanuel Trela and Enrique Suazua, where we've considered the wave equation with Neumann boundary control. And we have shown exponential turnpike. So that gamma is a number, it's between zero and one. And then in the control, you have here a part that is exponentially decaying, and here a part that's exponentially de increasing, just like we have seen at the beginning in our example with the hyperbolic cost. So this is really an exponential turnpike structure, and I think my time is over now. So 
I want to thank you for your attention and the last remark. So it's useful to use the, to have the turnpike property since this is the justification to use uh, the solution of the static problem as a starting point in numerics. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Guga. Now, uh, uh, very interesting talk. Thank you very much. Now we have the time for discussing and comments. Do you have any comments or questions? More or less, we have three or four minutes. Uh, may I ask just one question for the application of, say, industrial mathematics, maybe by your time, you know, you're taking no mathematics. Mm -hmm. I, I wonder that uh, the, the practical case is like a network of pipelines. Yeah, yeah that's then, true. Yeah. Then the, also already you mentioned during your talk, uh, the network case, I think Turnpike is quite sensitive to the shape or the connection of the network. So uh, something, do you have some? Uh, yeah. yeah, that's of course a very, very interesting <laughs> question. It's like with exact controllability. So mm -hmm. in these pipeline networks, mm -hmm. everything is good as long as you have trees. So as a mathematician, <laughs> No then, we, then we can do everything, but ah, similar, similar. Mm. in the case with cycles, mm, so you right. use the exact controllability, but the oh, interesting okay. thing is also in the case with cycles, the nodal profile exact controllability mm. holds and then here we can still have the turnpike property, mm. but yeah, there's a lot of uh, work to do. And the best possible results we clearly cannot expect for the real networks with cycles. So in practice, there will always be cycles. And then a lot of desirable structure like this classical exact controllability is lost. Yeah, and we are still, still working on this, uh, working on this. Thank you. And also, I think here the, um, among the audience, there is a specialist for the exact controversy for the graph. Uh, mm -hmm. but, yeah. uh, I'm just amateur, but however, I have another question. Uh, in the case of closed loop, exact controversy can be achieved by extra uh, input, some interior point. Mm -hmm. Then uh, at that expense, uh, your theory can give some similar results. I mean, with extra observation, node points, interior, like a cutting across the loop. Breaking yeah. The loop. yeah. So the connection to closed loop control is a very interesting point. So I did not get exactly uh, your description, oh, but what is very yeah. yeah. What is very clear that, so you see, we are, if the turnpike uh, property holds, we have these three parts of the time interval. And in yeah. the first time, so where a lot of activity is, you could also do a closed loop control, use a yeah. feedback stabilization. And the point is, you would not be far away from optimality. So this would make a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. But uh, whether this, again, whether this is possible, on a system with a lot of cycles, this depends on the number of controllers. So for the theory, it would be nice to have a lot of controllers everywhere, nodal controls everywhere, but this uh, is a mathematician's dream. In practice, you have actually very few controls in a large system. And yeah, we are still working on this. Okay, okay. Thanks for pointing out the Okay, Professor Guga, thank you very much. And uh, now still we have, uh, say, one minute. Do you have any short questions or comments? Okay. Uh, may I pose oh, a yeah, question? Yes, of course, please, yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Martin. It's Martin hi. here. Okay, so I have a question related to H2 regularization. So in the example you have shown, uh, there, ex uh, there is no turnpike, at least no exponential turnpike. Yeah, no exponential. Yeah, yeah, that's... Yeah, okay. So I'm interested if situation would change if you increase the uh, time framework, if you increase capital, uh, capital T. No, actually, so you saw the derivative is zero at zero. Mm -hmm. And this is... Uh, 
the form doesn't change if you stretch the time interval. So this remains. And so you do not really go down so, so steeply as in the exponential turnpike. And yeah, this was a bit surprising for me, but uh, I'm sure you have still uh, a weaker turnpike like the measure turnpike. This was very clear. Um, yeah, but for exponential turnpike, there's space for, for research. It's not do obvious. Do you have some kind of interpretation of this phenomenon? Why this happens with H2 and not with H1 regularization? Of what? Of? Of uh, this phenomena of the lack of uh, exponential third point for H2 regularization. Yeah, so it has to do with the fact that in the system dynamics, uh, the second derivative does not appear. So if you add a regularization in H1, you can in fact estimate uh, the norm of Yt by the state and the control. So there's not much difference to what was going on before, you see. And in H2, this is completely different because H2 comes unnaturally. It is, has no connection with the system. And I think that's the reason that this drives the system to a completely uh, different shape. Thank you again for okay. the question. Okay. Thank you. Okay, now unfortunately the time is uh, over and the, I would like to propose to go to the next second talk. Uh, Professor Hintamira, are you ready? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Let's just see how to share the screen here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, please take time. Uh, it's always an issue. Okay. That's fine. So that's fine. Let me just change the scope and the scale. Yeah, please, uh, please test. I hope, uh, okay, yeah. So I hope you can see now a full screen. Yes, it's okay. Okay, very yeah. good. But now, then thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> now, now I'd like to please let me introduce you. Is okay, okay, please. <laughs> now it's my great pleasure, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Mikhail Hintamira, uh, a professor of Humboldt Universität zu Berlin. And also he is a director of the Institute für Angewandte Mathematik und Statistik, and the, also she is a, uh, uh, he is a science fellow. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, his talk entitled by optimization with the learning informed differential equation constraints and its applications. Could you please start? I, I think uh, three minutes or something, some minutes, uh, yeah, shifted yeah, behind okay. the schedule. Good. Thank you very much. But I anyway have an appointment at 1 p.m. So I have to be within oh, time oh, somehow. Oh, oh, so it's all fine. <laughs> well, let me start. And thanks for the kind introduction. But let me also thank uh, Giuseppe and Enrique for setting up this meeting in a very complicated uh, time, actually. So I very much appreciate this. And in particular, also for inviting me. And Giuseppe, I have to say, it, uh, you have been charmingly patient with my sometimes slow answers. This is something which I appreciate a lot. So thank you very much. So I'll talk about some uh, optimization setup with learning informed PDEs. And I think it hits the scope of the workshop hopefully nicely because it tries to touch inverse problems and optimal control problems of these specific classes in one uh, sweep, so to speak. And let me also mention that this is joint work with two postdocs of mine, Guo Zitong and Kostas Papafitsoros, both at the Weierstrass Institute. Now, I'll start a bit gentle and also I ask you to be in general a bit gentle with me. This is our first kind of adventure with learning informed constituents. And there are some simple PDEs and simple applications behind. Of course, more complicated will follow, but this is just to understand the structure and some of the aspects of integrating learning informed components into optimal control. In that sense, I ask you to be patient to wait for a bit more complicated applications coming up soon. So what you see here on the first slide is a kind of classical, I would say, uh, 101 of modeling, where I would say in, let's say, physics, you observe certain phenomena, output data, and you generate those output data by specific scenarios, designs, or input data. And then you try to infer in between by ab initio considerations a mathematical model, uh, which then may contain some data components, for instance, parameters, which you then somehow fix. And after, uh, after all, you would use this model then later on for prediction, for control, or for inverse problems. 
But of course, there's a desire to be very accurate in physics, which uh, in certain applications has become a continuous challenge. So we can model certain constituents very fine, but other ones not so well after all. But we have more and more data available. And so the idea, of course, would be to try to benefit from data by using artificial neural network as one example here in order to guide uh, the modeling process. And then, okay. of course, you... Yes. Okay, I am Giuseppe. The slides are fixed in the first slide. Ah. Okay, I'm clicking okay, through. So. Yes, I'm okay. Sorry. Let me see. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry, I didn't recognize you. Maybe oh, I can no, change. Maybe I can change this because. Yeah. Uh, now, yes. Yeah, now it changes, but now it's not full screen. Yeah. Maybe it's a problem in the sharing, in the, in the option of uh, uh -huh. the screen. Let's see. Well, I think you can extend, expand the size. Expand the size. In the castle. And the, then the first of all, this you, good? Also, you this... Can, uh, also, you can delete uh, right margin. OK. The right margin, you said I deleted the left. Yeah, yeah because there are several uh, informations in the right margin. Then, then you can see the uh, the castle in the middle point. Yes, yes, please click this. Okay. Uh, yeah, here, here. Uh, okay, is it okay now? Can I you see a large? Improved. I, I think we improved. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so then, so this was the story of the last one minute. So how to come from uh, input output data and up initial modeling to a parameterized data driven model for prediction control and inverse problems. Now, what I would like to focus on in this talk is what you see on this slide. And I hope that the slides have been moving on because there should be now a slide with a green, a, a green box on the right, a red box on the left and the blue box in the middle. If you don't see this, please give me a signal. So the idea now would be the following. You generate uh, deliberate input data, UI, capital N minus scenarios. This could be controls, designs, I mean controls in the sense of fixed input quantities or design variables which you fix up front. Then you observe certain outputs, let's say from measurements, sometimes also from numerical observations. And in between you have a partially unknown physical process which maps you onto Y through some mapping pi. And pi itself could now be, for instance, the solution of an ODE or a PDE or something related. And that's what I'm interested in. Uh, but let's assume we do not know or partially don't know this physical process. Hence, we would like to equip this pi by learning informed components, which is this curly N in the center box in the blue box here. Hope you can see my little hand there. So which means you may completely replace pi by pi N or you just have specific constituents in a PDE model and then the inversion process would depend on some learning enforced components. And this is what this little n uh, tries to capture there. And then I'll look at a chain framework, which I call the general framework, which would be the general one for this talk, where you minimize a quadratic objective, typical output with squares or a tracking type objective from control. We are given some data G, which you like to match in a certain Hilbert space setting H, and you have some control U or some parameter U in an inverse setting, which you like to uh, find, and you need to pay a cost uh, or have to regularize the setting by some parameter alpha there. And then this mapping between U and Y becomes, of course, a constraint in this control problem, and the U itself may also be subject to further constraints, which are summarized here on the right and see admissible. So I'm motivated by two applications. The left one is a phase separation phenomenon, a very simple one where I'm trying to learn a double well potential, for instance, but it could be other potentials as well from data. And the right one is a quantitative MRI process where I try to invert uh, given certain uh, case-based data for physiological or physical parameters in a quantitative sense. So the difference between qualitative and quantitative MRI will be qualitative gives you qualitatively a right looking image or picture, but quantitative in addition gives you physical values or values for the parameters which match physical terms like uh, or physical quantities like uh, tissues, like skin, muscle, adipose, and so on and so forth. A brief guideline through the talk, I think uh, I'll give you some uh, recap of what we see currently in deep learning. Then I'll focus on one application, the other applications, and conclude. 
Now I'll start a bit with uh, bringing you into tune by looking at mathematics of deep learning and the current state. Of course, I have to be careful because there's lots of research in this field right now. And if you give the talk today, it might already be somehow update. There might be a need to update tomorrow. Um, but again, just to try to recap some basic as is needed here. I'm sure you've seen very often network structures like the one which I'm showing you here. Uh, you see on the upper left three input nodes depicted in yellow input layers, which are then connected to hidden layers, which are depicted here in green. And finally, there's an output layer in red. And you see in between the connections between the various uh, nodes of these uh, layers and uh, give you a little bit of terminology. The idea would be you have an affine transformation between each layer, which is this mapping WHL plus PL with unknown WL and PL. Uh, and then you have to decide on whether to activate or not activate a certain neuron. And this is what the function sigma does for you. And there are specific choices at hand, which I'll show you later on. And uh, if you have a one hidden layer case only, then you see here in this uh, lower part, an idea where you start with an initial setting. So the input U, which you F finally transform into the first layer you activate, and then you F finally transform into the output layer. And again, the unknowns here would be the Ws and the Bs, the shifts and the, and, and, and the matrices there. And these are typically determined by such a problem as I have written it down there, where you typically minimize a mismatch, a loss function delta between the output of the neural network and the, uh, the output or the measurement yj. You may have some a priori information which gives ideas to regularize this process in terms of w and p. And you may have additional constraints which are subsumed here in f admissible. And then you solve this problem, which is delicate in its own right, because it's typically a huge scale optimization problem, which is non-convex. And you would ideally try to find a good uh, solution to this problem, not just a stationary point. And secondly, uh, you also have to sometimes cope with non-differentiabilities and this complicates the picture quite a bit further. But we will not focus on this problem. Throughout this talk, I consider this process as being done. So you have input output data pairs and the learning process in, sen in the sense of, of solving this problem has been done. So you have your component curly N at hand already, which is then used in your PDE model. Now I'll focus analytically on, on this setting. Okay, so uh, what is known about such approximations using neural network type structures? There are some famous universal approximation results as I have depicted them here in these slides. Unbounded sets omega, for instance, in RM. And what you can see here that unless the activation function, recall this with the little sigmas, are polynomials, you can approximate uh, with uh, continuous activation functions, any continuous function over bounded set to any degree of accuracy. It, um, and the same would be true for the derivatives. If you increase the, the, the regularity of the activation functions and the Gannik's group polynomials, then you have again also a kind of a universal approximation result for the gradients. Uh, and this can even be repeated then for higher order derivatives as well. Now, what type of activation functions are known? Uh, there are smooth activation functions like the sigmoidal functions as depicted under the first bullet here, or prob probabilistic or probability in inspired functions like the soft max. So again, this is a smooth function. But what people have been using quite successfully and which will not unfortunately be the scope of this work is uh, non-smooth activation functions, such as the rectified linear unit. Uh, and I can tell you a little bit about the complications which come into place as soon as you replace a smooth by non-smooth activation function in the learning process, but also in the subsequent optimal control or inversion process. So that choice has numerous implications on both levels, which I'll not focus on any time for any further. So for the rest of the talk, we'll choose one of the smooth uh, activation functions and assume the learning problem has been solved correspondingly and we have at hand a, a network function N, which uh, is then of our further use. Now, another picture which I would like to give you is these different types of learning. So what you see sometimes is classifications along the lines, as I indicate here from one to four. In one, you see a sort of classical, rather simple approximation situation where you have uh, F uh, over a bounded subset of Rm into Rn. And in order to generalize uh, sort of regression, 
you can use artificial neural networks in order to better learn this uh, kind of functional correspondence between u and y. And, and this is, I think, a very well understood case by now. Under two, we see another case where it's a bit more interesting because you start from a subset K of some Banach space P1 into the final, so into Rn. This would be a setting which you see very often, for instance, in image classification. Uh, there is some understanding of such uh, network approximations already, but I think there's still some work going on, which is even more so and it becomes more and more delicate as you move down the list here in three, uh, you would have uh, a finite domain omega uh, from uh, within Rm and you map into some Banach space P2. This would be a typical situation when you try to solve partial differential equations by an approach which we call nowadays physics informed neural networks. And then again, the approximation theory has to be further advanced in this setting. What is kind of widely open, there's only a small number of references is that you learn an operator between two infinite dimensional spaces, P1 and P2. Uh, and this would be operator learning. An example would be learning the solution operator of a partial differential equation, for instance. And obviously, one of the major complications are compactness conditions as you move down from one to four as you become more and more delicate. Now, just to, to make sure that we understand the denominations correctly here, so I'll talk about learning informed physics, which is what you see on the right which means we are predicting certain constituents in the PDE models or maybe parts of the solution map or the entire solution map. But the loss function, the learning process is not necessarily the residual of a partial differential equation. And typically we look at the set situations where we try to find such an F between two infinite dimensional spaces. In contrast, physics informed learning or also known as PIN uh, does something else. It tries to uh, discretize typically a PDE in terms of a neural network, then the loss function very often is, is the PDE residual or certain other constituents. And the situation is that you move map from omega into P2, which means from finite dimensions into an infinite dimensional space. I've given you here some references for a very recent work on this operator type learning, and this might be of interest to explore uh, further also on uh, research wise in the future. Now, this is my brief recap of part learning, and let's now focus on the first application. I go back to my basic problem. I minimize an objective, which for the sake of simplicity, I keep quadratic because there's more, lots of motivation to look at such a quadratic objective already. Uh, with a given operator A, a given data point G, a given alpha, and specific input spaces H and control space U. There is a PDE or an equation mapping U or connecting U and Y. This is denoted by a little E here, and U has some additional constraints and see it visible. See it visible. Now, of course, if the situation is well posed, at least locally, what you can do is you can express Y as a function of U to the op operator P. It's a sort of implicitly defined functional operator pi, and then you reduce the problem to a problem only in the control variables U there. Uh, sorry. And then, as I indicated in my first or second slide, is I wish to replace now the pi by the pi n, where pi n uh, comes along either by learning one part of a PDE and then use a known solution technique, or try to learn the solution technique as a whole and then you replace the corresponding pi by pi n. What are fundamental questions? I'm just raising two here, but there are many more to answer, of course. Uh, one would be what are conditions for well postness of the learning, the learned physical model, and what kind of approximation properties do we have uh, for pi n uh, regarding pi? And of course, how does this carry over to optimization properties of optimizers in the minimization context or in the inverse problem context later on? Now, a first quick and simple result if you call Q the reduced map which uh, takes uh, U to y through pi and then applies a. So you can see here up front, it's the a pi. And if q has a subscript n, then we have a pi sub n as the corresponding reduced operator in mind. If this operator is weakly, weakly sequentially closed so with the obvious meaning, then you have a solution of this control problem. And there's also a special case uh, in the situation when uh, you have specific uh, compactness properties going on, as you would often see those in inverse problems where the regularization term tries to improve certain compact compactness properties. And then you can uh, reduce the, the, the 
kind of requirements and few in the sense of strong weak rather than weak weak. Uh, just uh, as a reminder, for many PDE models, we see that the regularity of PDE helps to improve and uh, helps the weak weak sequential closeness condition to some sense. Uh, depending on the type of PDE, you may have some compact embedding result going on because of regularity, and then you can exploit uh, the, this uh, weak to strong convergence in that very sense. And as I said, in imaging problems or inverse problems in more general, you would have the choice of a regularization term, which would then help and uh, give you some compact embedding there. And what do we know about approximation quality? I will call QN subsequently the A pi of a neural network described with a little n. So what you have to have in mind, for instance, is an expanding network, which gets more and more accurate in a sense of the approximation, which you can get. And this the, the corresponding index then will be N. Now, if uh, the Q and the QN over the control, control constraints satisfy such an approximation result uh, or, or inequality that the, the less equal some epsilon n and epsilon n goes to zero. And if you assume that un is the sequence of minimizers associated with the corresponding optimization problem where the q is replaced by qn, then you get these strong convergences here uh, to some u bar, where u bar indeed is a minimizer of the original optimization problem. So at least uh, this is again, maybe not a surprise, but what you can see is that for network approximations using universal approximation theory, uh, you can uh, prove that there is convergence as sort of consistency result in terms of uh, better and better approximating the true solution. You can also get some sort of rates. Uh, if you take with L0, the Lipschitz constant of this map Q, uh, remember pi could be nonlinear, A is a linear operator. And L1, the Lipschitz constant of Q prime. And let's call eta n the difference between Q prime and Qn prime in the corresponding operator norm. Then, under some condition, smallness condition on the Lipschitz constant, you can prove that there are rates uh, for Un to converge uh, to U bar in the sense as I've depicted it down here. So the capital O is, of course, just standing for some constant as n goes to infinity. And you have a first order in epsilon n and the first order in qn. And you can already see the specification in the setting where uh, you would have exact uh, exact matching or exact control, which means you find a u bar which hits such that q of u bar hits the g, then everything depends on on this approximation order epsilon n there. And there's an improvement of this result. Uh, I haven't depicted it as the smallest conditions on L0 and L1, but it's more stringent up here than down there. Uh, so which means you get a weaker condition on L1 in the setting where the J prime, the reduced objective happens to be zero, which means the constraints in U bar are redundant, can be left out. Then you get the similar but slightly better approximation result. Now, let me now enter into case studies. What I've given you now is on this general optimization problem, I've given you some sort of general approximation results and convergence results. And now we look at specific cases to give you an idea how to use such an answer. Now, one example, and again, I have to uh, beg for your patience. Here we look at the simple model problem just to give you the idea. Let's assume you look at the semilinear equation where the semilinearity, this little f here, is unknown. It may depend on x, it, can, it will depend on y, which is the state of the system here. And the idea would be you try to learn this f from uh, network data, replace f by n, and then you try to understand what the corresponding solution which is then obviously uh, a sort of a hybrid model in a sense that you only learn n rather than the whole solution process. And then you apply the solution process for the resulting semilinear equation and try to see where you end up with actually. So this is a pi n, which is not learned per se, but it's learned through the constituent in the PDE and the subsequent solution process for the partial differential equation. Now, under some assumptions, and I want to, would not want to go to all the details, you have a caratiaturi function in essence. Uh, this is what uh, the first item says. You have a certain growth rate, which of course is also known for superposition operators that, that is needed. We assume that you have a co certain coercivity of the primitive function, which uh, is the capital F, such that capital F uh, differentiated with respect to the second component gives rise to the little f. And also there's a boundedness from below assumption. Then you can prove if your control is sufficiently regular in the sense of Lebesgue index R here, that you have existence of a solution. So this is a kind of simple 
estimation argument there and using a kind of Fellows inequality in between. But the second theorem is now interesting in terms of in universal approximation because it says for such settings, you can also get not just H1 regularity, but also regularity in the sense of the continuous functions over omega bar. And you have a uniform upper bound K there, which is a positive constant over all admissible uh, use there. This is of interest because remember we said that neural networks are good at approximating any function as long as the function is to be considered on a bounded set. Now we have to understand to what extent the little f, which is of course not known, but it's in the background theoretically, so to speak, is can be considered on a bounded set. And of course the domain omega would often be bounded, but if the y is now also bounded in the sense of continuous functions, you can already see that we have to consider this little f approximation only on a bounded set. And this is of course what helps the universal approximation result. So, uh, the first step, of course, is to understand to what extent the network-based approximation, so this is what the PDE is down here, also meets the solution. And again, you can show that uh, given this universal approximation result, even on the based on the previous observation, you can approximate any f to arbitrary degree of accuracy by an n, and hence you can get also existence of a weak solution and corresponding a priori bounds. And as I said, the infinity bound on y was used, uh, was used there, uh, of course, uh, with a high degree of importance. And then of course you can continue the investigation. I will be very quick here. Uh, you would like to understand sensitivities or first and first maybe Lipschitz properties. Now remember that the little n always means you look at the network. Uh, now here it's different actually, here it's an approximating sequence and pi n is a specific solution map to the network corresponding to the network n. And then we can see two things. First of all, Lipschitz continuity uh, with a specific constant, which can be spelled out explicitly depending on the type of PDE. And you have a directional differentiability result as indicated down there, which means you look at sensitivities of the state uh, under perturbations of U, which is of course important in order to get the result uh, uh, for a KK of KTT type characterizing stationary points. Now a little aspect here. So I told you that it's only important to approximate this little f on, on a bounded set. And what you see here is a little example coming from double well potentials. So I have given you the approximation, very simple one down there. Y to the third minus Y coming from the corresponding ginsburg lambda energy there. Uh, and here you would say the approximation of the original f is not so well in this region, let's say where you have this huge discrepancy between the red and blue. But it turns out that only the neighborhood of zero is really of importance here in particular we're interested between ideally minus one and one, which uh, de denominates the two phases in a two phase model uh, for the mixing where the Ginsburg lambda energy would be used for. And in the neighborhood of this minus one and one interval, you have a very perfect matching as you can see it on the right hand side. So the idea would be there is a downside because you may not approximate the full energy well but sometimes it suffices to approximate the specific area well. And this is the case for the Stinsberg lambda energy, but in both cases, you need a certain boundedness of F on, uh, on, on the corresponding bounded set. Okay, and this is the corresponding energy. I think this is no surprise given the previous pictures there. Now I'm trying to work a bit towards uh, approximation quality, but also take the conditions. So this slide tells you that uh, uh, for any f, we can get uh, the, uh, given the observations that y is uh, on a bounded set, a map n, so that you approximate this f well up to any degree of accuracy epsilon positive. And this is, of course, then carried over to the solution map pi pi n, and uh, also to this kind of adjoints uh, p0, p epsilon down there with the corresponding rate where uh, epsilon again is the error for the zero order information, epsilon one now is the error for the first order information, the dyf over dyn. And this is where you can see that, for instance, smoothness of the network activation functions already comes in at this instrumental importance there. And of course, with this setup, you're in place to check, uh, for instance, classical Karos conductor theory, and you can write down a first order commodity system as I did it there. Uh, and then you can solve this system by any solver which you have at hand. Uh, we did the same with Newton method for the quadratic sub problems within a sequential quadratic programming approach and use the specific L1 line search technique in order to update from UK to UK plus one. I won't go into the details, but rather show the results here. So what you see there is um, 
On the left hand side, uh, the, the, the diagram of the order parameter, which should be between minus one and one, where for the experts minus one means, uh, for instance, black here, you're in the phase of, let's say, uh, substance A, pure phase. And if you're at one, you're in the pure phase of substance B. And in between, you see a mixed state between the two, two phases. This is the usual sort of diagram as we see very often in this kind of phase field modeling. And you see here on the left, the exact solution, state and control pairs. And on the right, you see the corresponding um, machine learned quantities uh, or controls and, uh, and, and state pairs coming from machine learned quantities. And there's a high coincidence between the two. Of course, you may ask how did the network learning procedure look like? We did uh, experiment with 150, 300 and 600 degrees of freedom uh, relating to one, three and five hidden layers. And the middle one with 300 typically gave these kind of results. And for the learning process, we used a simple Lambert marker type procedure. They could have used to have the gradient types. Second application, uh, this is here on image processing. So this is now another case study. Now, for those of you who know magnetic resonance imaging, we already had a talk this morning on image processing to some extent. Um, uh, it uses uh, typically, um, yeah, electromagnetic properties of protons, uh, particular hydrogen atoms here. And the idea would be that you have alignment of magnetic nuclear spins in an applied constant magnetic field, which is called P0. And then you deliberately then perturb this alignment by a frequency pulse P1 and apply gradient field G to distinguish individual contributions. And this gives rise to these different tissues uh, in magnetic resonance imaging. And if you want to come up with a mathematical model, mapping uh, so-called relaxation times for, uh, coming from this perturbation and time, how long it takes in transversal and longitudinal direction according to the diagram uh, to come back to the rest state. You can, do a, you can compute the magnetization Y by this uh, ordinary differential equation, at least in an approximate way. This is the block equation, which is then applied in a voxel-wise sense. So which means you may have a two or 3D volume and you do not apply PDE there in the two or 3D, but you discretize your volume into voxels or pixels. And then you apply this in a pixel or voxel wise sense. And then in this setting, the unknown would be Y uh, and, the, and the material dependent quantities would be for instance, T1 and T2 and rho, the proton density where T1 is the uh, transversal and T2 the longitudinal relaxation time which then is characteristic for a specific tissue. And quantitative MRI tries now to uh, do the following. Uh, okay, here I give you some idealized T1 and T2 values just to see how it looks like in the proton density row. So these quantitative parameters for a brain scan there. And what MRI does now, it, uh, it measures quantities G delta, which are Fourier transformed quantities. And then of course you have a kind of uh, subsampling because you cannot possibly record all Fourier coefficients. So you have a subsampling matrix P, Fourier coefficient Y, and then you try to match this given or measured data G delta uh, by some Y, which is the corresponding magnetization coming through this uh, ODE constraint there. Uh, and U would be the quantity of interest. This is T1, T2 and rho, the proton density, as I just gave you the idea on the previous slide. You have some initial conditioning constraints on you, which uh, then would confine rho T1 and T2 to physiologically meaningful ranges. This is something which you can decide up from. Uh, and what is observed in practice often is that the ODE model is not accurate enough. And then you wish to replace, given certain measurement data, which you have at hand, which you replace the solution for the ODE model, for instance, by a neural network learned solution map there. Typically, I have to admit after some time discretization because the time discretization is something specific to this pulse frequency or pulse sequence P1, as I indicated on, the, on, on an earlier slide. And this is then used for discretizing the ODE in time and sometimes allows for even a, a, a sort of exact solution formulas there. But the idea is now the ODE might be inaccurate. And this is what our colleagues from medical engineering tell us often. And so you try to replace now this uh, ODE by a data learned ODE, but, but not really the ODE, but rather the solution operator in its own right. This is what the N does here. 
And of course, this can be done, and there is some theory behind it in the interest of time. I'll be short again. So the idea would be the same. You use a feedforward network. You can show approximation existence and other results similar to what I've shown you before. Uh, for this operator pi n here, again, this is a solution operator here for an ODE admittedly, but it's not just learning one constituent in, a, in an ODE or PDE and then take the original solution map. It's a bit more challenging here, but you get specific approximation results. And then you use again a kind of sequential quadratic programming algorithm again to update with an incomplete Hessian approximation because of the complications coming from nonlinearities. It's a sort of, uh, if you wish, Gauss Newton type approximation in a sense uh, for this quadratic step. And then we do an update again according to a line search. And what you see here is uh, two things. On the upper front, you see the learning, uh, you see the, the the original model, so the block type model, which has been used for reconstructing from data. You see again the T1 times, the T2 times, and the row. So we have a nice quantitative reconstruction there. But you can see comparing with the bottom line or bottom row that there is a specific difference, but also similarity. And the learning enforced model, which uses a similar kind of approximation strategy as before with three hidden layers and 300 unknowns uh, in total. Uh, under this uh, kind of learning regime uh, performs uh, remarkably well. And if you look at the residual maps between uh, the best known T1 and T2, you can see that uh, the errors for the learning enforced models are sometimes a little lower than the errors for the uh, model with, with the sort of true analytical setting. And in that sense, the learning enforced uh, situation gives hope that we can transfer it now to more complicated situations. This is what we're trying to do now. For instance, currently we're looking into CINE data, which would be time dependent data there. And then we need to also adjust polarization in a specific way. And this challenges the whole setup even further. But the idea would be now you have two types of motions, so to speak. One motion is the time dependence in this kind of block type learned equation. The second one could be a motion coming from some cardiac MRI. Yeah, there is a kind of natural motion by breathing and things like this. So this is just a kind of glimpse at what we are trying to look at now for this setting here. Uh, but to finish off, let me say what we are currently having in our hands. We have a kind of generic optimization framework with learning informed physical constraints, which could be parts of a PDE. It could also be a solution map in its entirety. Of course, with respect to the latter, I'm realistic for very complicated PDEs. It's going to be very difficult to learn the solution map in their entirety. But if you have a VDE, which, uh, which let's say has a solution space on a low dimensional manifold, depending on some parameters, then there's good hope that learning can do a good, good job there. We have analysis and numerical solvers for the, this optimization framework as I've given it to you uh, throughout this talk here. We are trying to find a scope on how to learn uh, specific operators between infinite dimensional spaces and uh, use this kind of universal approximation theory. Although we can try to be uh, even more, more specific now by using recent results on solar space approximation. What you're currently looking at is uh, on the one hand side, making applications more complicated. On the other hand side, trying to understand a bit better what non-smooth activation functions will do to our setting there. And uh, I can give you some ideas where it gets more, more complicated then. And otherwise, the interplay between learning and optimal control. Remember, I said that learning is supposed to be done and I just focus on optimization as to, or, or solving for the inverse problem. But in reality, you would, like to, you would like to ideally tune both schemes into one overall algorithm by solving the learning problem only to the extent needed whenever you're early along in the optimization or the optimal control iterations and so on and so forth. With this, I would like to stop and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Hintamira. Now, uh, I hope still you can have a time for discussing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, and then the, we have three or five minutes uh, for discussing. Do you have any comments and questions? Just sorry, Yamamoto. Uh, uh, sorry, please. Masahiro. Can I ask something? Sure, 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 please. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry that I, I have my mask on. Yeah. So, uh, Mikhail, thank you for your talk. So, um, uh, in your, uh, say, uh, 
nonlinear nonlinearity identification problem, you you assume you have the Laplacian right somehow given, right? Yes, Did I, I am. Yeah. So uh, of course there is uh, people believing that uh, well you don't even need this right so that you can simply take data from scratch and then be able to yeah. identify a neural network model out of uh, simply the data without uh, putting this a priori say more mechanistic perspective right in which you 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 say okay the laplacian is there and i'm just uh, try to identify the subordinated nonlinearity. Uh, mm -hmm. do you think that's possible at all or what is your experience in this uh, yeah. context uh, i mean this uh, thank you for raising this i mean i think first of all we just wanted to demonstrate that very often and i think this is not so uncharacteristic that you have a modeling process where some parts are well understood from ab initio modeling and the other parts are, are not that well understood or might change depending on regimes this was the target here uh, and this is why it was hybridized in a sense of the Laplacian and this simple example was supposed to be known and F is unknown. But in general, I think, uh, I mean, it depends very much on the underlying PDE in my opinion. If you have a very rich PDE, so to speak, so that uh, you have a high dimensional solution, solution space depending on specific parameter settings, which you would then uh, set, set as inputs for, for instance, your, um, your uh, neural network learning procedure, then I'm not so sure that neural networks can really give you the full, the full, uh, let's say, the solution map to its full extent. If you can confine yourself to certain sub-regimes, then I think uh, learning can do a good job. In particular, on the other hand, if you have a PDE where depending on the solution, uh, on, on the input parameters or control settings, the output space is simple in a sense, so it can be well approximated, then I think learning may be a valid, uh, a valid procedure there. But in general, uh, I think for a very complex PDE where you have uh, a high dimensional solution manifold, I think you need lots of data in order to approximate such a solution well. So in that sense, I would very carefully look at the PDE model and, uh, and try to understand uh, what it can do. I mean, for the ODE, my second example, I think we can see that for the ODE models, we are already in a, in a good situation, but I believe also there, if the ODE model becomes very, very non-linear and very complicated, there might also be some caveats there. So okay. hard to Thank give you. you a very, very yeah, hard yeah. to give yeah, you a very precise uh, yeah. answer there, but it's sort of- That's uh, uh, more than enough, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Michael. Sorry, I removed my video because the quality <laughs> of the connection is bad where I am here. Okay, thank no you worries, again. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, do we have a, any short question, comments? Uh, Luke Snow, when do you have no questions or comments? Once again, I would like to thank the two speakers, uh, uh, Professor, uh, 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 Professor Guga and Professor Hintamira for ex uh, exciting, interesting talks. And also I would like to thank the audience inspiring the session. Now the session is over. I hope that uh, nice lunch and maybe there are some announcement from the organizer. Giuseppe, do you have any okay. announcement? Uh, okay, no. Um, we start again at 3 p.m. with the, uh, the afternoon slot with the professor uh, Alessio Borretta and Maurizio Falcone in the first uh, afternoon slot. Thank you so, uh, to all of the participants. Thank you so much. Right, thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.